Yeah, so whoever's talking shows up. Yeah. Well, welcome everyone to our March meeting of the Alpha Bird Nature Club. Um, it's a pretty wild and woolly evening out there. Um, this is why we like to be able to offer both a in-person and a Zoom um, capacity here so that we can, you know, uh, have speakers from other places and, and um, participants from all over. Um, the uh, only other person in the building with me today is Paul Goyette, who's uh, helping me set everything up today. And, and uh, we appreciate uh, his coming down to, to give a hand. Um, you know, I wasn't expecting a snowstorm in March and, and John and I had hoped to at least uh, have a little bit of a day out of it today, but uh, the, weather, the weather controls things. Um, so just uh, a little to start off, um, our next meeting is going to be um, again on Zoom and um, at the Alpha Public Library. And we're joining with the library and other people with David Pogue talking about uh, climate change and what we can do about it. So um, he's a pretty uh, infamous speaker and uh, we look forward to that session um, for our March uh, meet, for our April meeting. Um, the birds have been uh, starting to climb back. I was out today a little bit the, the, this afternoon and the Branch Bridge has several, uh, probably a hundred plus uh, ring neck ducks. There's a common golden eye, hooded bergansers, and a uh, greater scop among the mix. So um, not much open water, but what's there, they seem to be utilizing. Um, uh, shout out, I just, I just want people to know that uh, I just returned from Texas with uh, Ernie LeBlanc and Jeff Johnstone and Bob Mallett for a quick weekend of looking at the Bat Falcon uh, near Santa Ana Wildlife Refuge, which is a first US record. And we saw the uh, a golden crowned uh, warbler, which is like a second US record and a social flycatcher, which is also a first record for the United States. So we, we cleaned up pretty well with some life birds and a we went from Friday to Tuesday and it was 85 degrees there over the weekend. And uh, it doesn't feel like that now at all. So anyway, so that's that. Um, we do have, uh, we do look forward to Jeff Johnstone's field trip starting up in mid-April. Um, check the ABNC website for more information. And we're still looking to have other people who wish to lead a trip or other ideas for uh, spring and summer programming. Uh, we, we hopefully this pandemic's getting beyond us, and and uh, we'll be able to get out and enjoy nature together. So, with that, I'd just like to introduce our speaker, John Soliner, and I go back quite a few years, a couple of decades or so. Um, the uh, when I was spending a lot more time in the Grafton, uh, Broadmeadow Brook area. John was on many of the birding and butterfly field trips with us. And um, he was also a pretty good photographer, which I'd never really mastered. So uh, I know John at the time was thinking that this is what he wanted to do. And very few people I know actually pull it off. So um, I'm really happy for John and happy to have him here with us this evening. So John, it's all yours. So John Salina. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you, David, for having me. And um, I've been involved with this um, 54. And I remember getting dropped off at wildlife refuges when I was a kid. And I think my parents were kind of hoping I'd get lost. But, um, but thank you very much for the inspiration, uh, David, and also Tom Tining, Mark Lynch, and John Green were really instrumental and many of you know those people. Hopefully you do. They're great people. Been a huge inspiration for me when I dreamed of doing this for a living. And um, I really miss the days back in the Quabbin and stuff like that. And now I'm on the road a lot, so I don't get to go as much. All right. Well, a uh, little bit about myself. I'm a professional nature photographer, and I basically have a tour company and I travel across the U.S. doing tours. But when I was talking to David, we were thinking it'd be a good idea to just show some of the beautiful places in North America. 
and maybe give you ideas on different trips you can do. So these are some of the places I go. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of them. Not as a sales pitch. I wouldn't actually even recommend my company unless somebody was a photographer um, because we might have one cooperative subject and spend hours with the same animal or whatever. So, okay, my company name. Um, I'm sponsored by Hunt's Photo and Video, a really great camera star if anybody's interested in photo gear. And I have a contact person, Alan S. Okay, so first of all, as you can see behind me, I have several books, um, just mostly wildlife books and hiking guides and nature guides and nature walks and biology of certain animals. And, um, and then it's a lot of research that goes into finding all these places. Um, in the past, I would buy every book and magazine and postcard on the, on the area. And then now with the internet, there's a lot of great sources. And sometimes it's a double-edged sword because some of these areas are getting exploited by giving away nesting locations and things like that. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, one of my favorite tools is Google Earth because I can go to, a, say it's my favorite moose pond. I might find out there's a great moose pond behind it or, or great ideas. And it's nice to get an aerial view of the habitat you're in. And then, um, and then a lot of it's just old fashioned um, building a network and helping out people and kind of forming an alliance where you exchange ideas and stuff like that. A lot of times when I fly into an area, I go out to dinner with a lot of local people and it's a good way to, um, to find out all the, where the latest things are happening. Like let's say a red fox builds a den in a certain area that wasn't there the year before, I wouldn't know about it. And then the other thing is with our cell phones, we have all different apps that'll give us the weather. It's amazing how much things have changed in 20 years. The weather, the sunrise, sunset times, uh, the tide shots, the, where the Milky Way is, all these incredible things. And then basically the more time you're in the field to join yourself, the more things you see. I'm going to start talking about several locations. I just want to go over a few generic things. Um, these four things I think are critical to me. On the top left-hand side is a fire starter. Only weighs a few ounces, costs less than $10. To me, that should always be in your backpack or camera bag or whatever. Um, I have a, a tablet where I have a lot of podcasts about nature and photography and all these movies and comedy and songs. And that's what I use for flying and driving. And then I have the Garmin GPS where I save my favorite locations. So if you travel across the country, I want to make sure I remember where everything is and the local restaurants and all the logistical things. And then a headlamp, even if you're not planning on going out at night, you never know when you'll have an emergency. So it's good to have a lamp. And then now the technology changed for hand warmers at this time of year. Um, on the left, you get the, you know, the disposable type packs. And on the right is um, now they have hand warmers that you can charge for USB. And then biology, you guys know more than anybody, the more you learn about an animal's biology and habitat, the more cool things you see. So what I'm going to do is talk about several locations. I'm going to start with just showing some scenic images and then talk about some of the wildlife in the area. Um, one of, we're going to start local and then we're going to go all the way out to Alaska. This will be just North America. So uh, this is Acadia National Park. Great place. Really beautiful, and as you know, four or five hours from here. And just just great scenery, great for sea ducks and waterfowl and red foxes, and it's beautiful. Here's some of the early morning shots I've taken. You don't get much sleep as a nature photographer. Some of this stuff is like 4.30 in the morning or at night. Um, one of the parts of Acadia nearby is the Scudic Peninsula, and it's probably like four or five miles from the mainland Acadia, but it's almost a one hour drive because you have to drive around the peninsula, but you lose 90% of the crowd. So I think if anybody goes to Acadia, you really 
losing something if you don't check out that one place. And the Cadillac Mountain at sunrise, now you need a reservation, um, which is actually a good thing. I don't mind the $2 or $4. It's better than seeing hundreds of cars up there. Really great wildflowers. And be careful not to trample them. Lupin. And again, just a beautiful place. And I like to go there also in the fall. So I really like June because July, the crowds build. So I recommend between um, the month of June or um, Acadia usually peaks around October 15th. And if that doesn't overlap a weekend, you, you'll get a lot less people. And a lot of beautiful places nearby. Um, I also recommend heading up the main coast and heading towards Cutler and Eastport and all these different areas. And lots of great birds and wildlife and a, a big nesting population of eagles. And I would recommend getting out on a boat and going out to places like um, you could drive out to Campobello Island. But there's a lot of great places out there also. And it's a whole different culture out there. Uh, this is stuff in Campobello Island and Lebec, Maine. And then the Canadian Lighthouses. And what I do is I get, I charter a boat and go out and see seals and whales and nesting eagles and all that. This is off our boat. But one of the highlights of the trip nearby is um, Machaya Seal Island, where you can go out to see the puffins. And, it, and here's some razor bills. And it's just a great place to see all that stuff. I love the razor bills and the puffins. And they basically nest uh, from late May to early August. So as long as you go in um, June or July, um, you're, you're on the safe side. Sometimes if you go in May, you might they might not all have started nesting or they might have left if you went in August. Uh, the razor bills are the first in, first out before the puffins. But anytime June or July is prime time. You never really see the chicks because they're underground under the rocks. And then a northern gannet's been unsuccessfully trying to nest there for a while. And then um, a lot of times the boats will go by different seals. Um, th this in this picture is um, gray seals. If you notice, they have like a horse head versus the, the you know the regular harbor seal. And then other parts of New England, um, we used to have a really huge moose population, but with the warmer temperatures and a lot of other stressful things related to temperature, um, the moose population has dropped considerably. Uh, back in the day, uh, if you went to some of the great spots like Baxter State Park, Moosehead Lake, Rangeley, Maine, Northern White Mountains, Errol, uh, New Hampshire, all those places, you could get uh, my records like 20 something moose in one day. And now I could spend 20 days sometimes just to find one moose. And they're just a beautiful animal. And then the common loon. Um, this one, I was just trying to show the habitat. I love loons and loon country, and I really miss it. I haven't been able to do that recently because I've been on the road so much. And then here's where the ride in the mother's back or the father's back. Both parents have the chicks on the back, usually just the first two weeks after they're born. And they build their strength, and each day they're allowed less time to ride on the parent's back. Snowy owl. Lots of great opportunities, especially on an eruption year in New England. Red fox. Great gray owls. Uh, this one was in New England. Um, they don't come down that often, but when they do, it's super exciting. And then I usually go farther north, is if we get a lot of New England, there's even more in Canada. Lupin, June, peak. And then obviously fall foliage. Um, usually the first week of October is pretty good for Northern New England and then uh, the middle of October for different parts of Massachusetts and then even later in October for Eastern Mass 
And I just love fall foliage. We're going to talk about more about wildlife, but some of them, Vermont. And then the, uh, the local wildlife, this picture was actually taken uh, at the Quabbin and it was um, a young fawn just born. Um, I usually find about the last week of May, first week of June. And then if you spend time with certain animals without disturbing them, you get those precious moments. So um, this one, I was just backlighting it to show him breathing. There was a cold morning. Here's a trip that you could all do that's pretty easy to do. It's um, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia coast, four to six hours, four to eight hours, I would say. And there's just unlimited opportunity. There's a lot of great wildlife refuges down there. Um, very accessible. You can even take a boat out of New Jersey to get there or drive down over the Delaware Bridge. But this corridor is pretty special. Um, off the top of my head, you have Bombay Hook National Wildlife Refuge and then um, Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge in Maryland, a bunch of things. They have a Delaware Burning Trail, which will give you a lot of great ideas. And going to Southern Virginia coast and you got Chickatique National Wildlife Refuge. There's just so many great places out there, a lot of great state parks. Uh, this deserves its own trip. And then, and then the sun rises are beautiful. This is Chickatique National Wildlife Refuge. And then I like to photograph the whole biodiversity of prey mantis on the beach, a ghost crab. And then in the fall, um, it's getting later every year with the warmer temperatures. But I used to do this in October, but now uh, I pushed it all the way back into mid-December for the snow geese migration. Uh, with the warmer temperatures, they don't need to migrate south as, as often or as, as early as they did in the past. So as you can see, you can get a lot of them. It's just pretty special. So that these, uh, these pictures were at Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge in, in, um, in Maryland. And then common yellow for oyster catcher. Indigo bunting, lots of great birds, great egrets, and probably some snow egrets. And it's just such a beautiful place. And then the other uh, draw for some people is photographing the wild horses. There's some great places in the Carolinas, which would be even better, but this is Assateague State Park in uh, Maryland. Earlier I said Bombay Hook, that's in Delaware. But um, this is Assateague uh, State Park in Maryland and or Assateague Island, which is bordered by the National Wildlife Refuge. And um, it's pretty cool for seeing the horses. And then in April, the whole Delmarva Peninsula has a big, I would say April into May, has a huge horseshoe crabs come out on the beach to lay eggs which um, draws in literally millions of shorebirds. I've never done this, but it's on my list. This is the endangered, now threatened Delmava fox squirrel, which is similar to the gray squirrel. And it kind of looks bigger and fatter. Bombay Hook National Wildlife Refuge at Cambridge, Maryland. I mean, Blackwater, sorry, I'm mistaken all the refuges. And you can see it's just a special place. Another side trip you can do in the winter is stop by the Conowingo Dam in Maryland. It's right off 95. Um, and this place um, has a huge population of bald eagles. And they basically have a dam. And when they release the dam, a bunch of fish get stirred up and then a lot of eagles come out. Sometimes you can see 20, 30 eagles at one time. And then this is one of my favorite places, Florida in general. This is a boardwalk at Corkscrew Swamp. And then I spend a lot of time in Florida. There's just incredible places like going all the way down the West Coast and East Coast in the Everglades. Um, and it's just an amazing place with just 
just incredible opportunity. And also, um, I know places like Sanibel Island and the Everglades and places like that are pretty famous, but when you play around in some of these places, like in Titusville, Cape Canaveral area, it's pretty special. Delray Beach has a bunch of stuff. Um, working all the way down his Delray Beach, Trebelka, Boca Raton, uh, the Everglades, the water comes down towards um, the flows from Lake Okeechobee down to the Everglades and unfortunately gets diverted and that becomes a big political situation. But um, um, we're starting to see some of the water come back to the end of the Everglades in the Flamingo Bay area. Um, in the past, they diverted them. I'm starting to see a different amount of a uh, larger amount of pelicans now as some of the fresh water is coming down. And then the West Coast, Sanibel Island and the Sterile Lagoon and just so many great places. Fort DeSoto. And I love interior uh, Florida for stuff too. And here's the path, the historical path of when the water comes down, <coughs> excuse me, from Lake Okeechobee into the Everglades. Tree frog, the alligators. I love reptiles and amphibians. This is one of my favorites. Um, croc, I love seeing the saltwater crocodiles. As you can see, a different facial profile, uh, diff size difference, um, no different habitats they like. Uh, one of the crocodiles actually was living in Sanibel Island for years, and they're much bigger than the alligators. So the alligators. The crocodile loved to hang out in fresh water, which is a little bit unusual. And then the alligators went into the salt water to avoid the crocodile. So it's pretty interesting. This is a huge crocodile, about 12 feet long. Uh, the locals, we named them Croxilla. And then this is a problem, even though it's kind of a cool photo. Uh, this is where this uh, huge, Florida has a lot of problems with invasive species. And this is the iguanas, which is starting to show up in high numbers. And they're a problem. And then every once in a while, Florida gets a cold front and it knocks down the Burmese python and the, uh, the, some of the lizards that don't belong there. But on the other hand, it hurts the manatees and the saltwater crocodile. One of my favorite animals, the desert tortoise, the gopher tortoise. This is pretty cool. Soft shell turtle. There's just a lot of reptiles and amphibians. The turtles summon themselves. Armadillo. Manatees. Uh, there's one spot in Florida where you can legally go in the water with them and um, even touch them at the Crystal River. And um, there's just, it's just a special moment where you get to see a wild manatee and be in the water with it. Bobcat in the tree, raccoons. And then one of the reasons the birding so spectacular in Florida is just the conjugation of birds and the proximity. This is a wide angle lens and there's probably 10 different species in there. I see the tricolored heron, the roseate spoonbell, the great egret, snow egret. Um, there's white pelican. I think there might be a brown pelican in there somewhere. Uh, I see a comorant. I mean, it's just so many credible species. That gives you a rough idea. A snowy egret. You can just walk up and do headshots. A comorant. Notice the downy feather when he was preening on his bell. The eye pattern. The anhinga. Really beautiful bird. Um, they can't repel the water naturally, so they dry their wings. And then this is where they get the nickname, the snake bird, because it looks like a snake to some people when he's swimming underwater and just sticking his head up. Turkey vulture, black vulture, pelicans, white pelicans, huge bird. Brown pelicans. Brown pelicans diving for schools of fish. Sometimes when these are a good school of fish, you just see hundreds of birds going in it, going after it. It's pretty fun. Um, great egret. And then every once in a while you see predation. Um, so 
this alligator is sneaking up on the great egret and it kind of stinks seeing predation so i have to go in there and grab the alligator and move him so he doesn't grab the egret no, i'm just kidding but um but it, i don't know how sometimes i see birds two or three inches from alligators and the bird's not nervous and the alligator is not going after them they have a slow digestive system so they don't actually eat that often and then here we get a great egret breeding plumage going to feed the babies. I mean, to build the nest. Great blue heron. Here's some nest building. And then I went in and um, this shot was in the morning and I liked that sequence. And I said, that nest is at the top of the tree. I w and I looked and I lined it up with sunset. I went back later and did a sunset silhouette of the same um, nest. And then um, here we get an immature wood stalk next to a great blue heron. And you can see the great blue heron just caught a snake. The wood stalk's probably hoping the snake, is, the, the blue heron will drop it. Um, nest building. Yeah, try to show the behaviors with my photography. Um, black crown night heron, yellow crown night heron, reddish egret. They're a fun to photograph. Is they're always running around like lunatics. And you can, it's just a joy to see their antics. It's fun seeing the different species of herons and egrets and their feeding strategies to, to catch fish. Purple Galano. And then the osprey. I love osprey. They just photograph of their different behaviors. And it's just the shrike um, with the hook bill. And then this was interesting. Um, this was a water snake in the water. Um, and basically this comrade was trying to eat the snake and the snake was trying to strike the comrade in self-defense. And the battle went on for a while. Then a bunch of spoonbills came in and then they went after that snake, but they were too shy. And the snake ended up getting away unharmed. Hooded merganser. Limpkin. Interesting note about Florida. Um, when I'm on the west coast of Florida, I don't see as much waterfowl. And when I'm on the east coast, I see a lot more. Limpkin, oyster catcher, bittern, American bittern. And Florida is just beautiful. I love the alligators and the habitat, the cypress trees, a lot of great birds, the kites. Swallowtail kite before that. It's just great seeing them. Stale kites over here. And it's just, uh, there's a few areas of Florida with this bird's in trouble, but um, there's a few areas of Florida where you, you can see them pretty readily. Scrub jay, another. Now it's time to show more of the endangered birds with the snail kite. Bald eagles regurgitate the food to feed the chicks. Wood stalks. And then spoonbills are one of my favorites. And then the flower is just so special. Here we got a spoonbill with the, with the black neck stilt. Owls. Barring owls are pretty easy to see in Florida. Great horned owl chick. Barred owl. And now we're in the Smoky Mountains. Now, the Smoky Mountains are mostly in Tennessee and North Carolina. Um, one of the reasons it's so special is it's basically for the northern range of species. The Smoky Mountains is at the southern border for them. I mean, at the northern border. Uh, like the last call for some of the northern species, they end their range around the Smoky Mountains. And ironically, for the southern species, they start ending their northern range along the Smoky Mountains. So it gives incredible biodiversity. You're talking about one of the best places in the country, on the eastern part of the country, for wildflowers, uh, reptiles, amphibians, salamanders, uh, just an incredible place. 
And if you drove straight down um, from Massachusetts, it's to me, it's about a 16 hour ride. But on the way down, you can stop in Washington, D.C., Shenandoah, Blue Ridge Mountains, some of the old historic battlefields. You could break that ride up. Or you could fly down pretty easily. And you can see it's just beautiful. This is the same tree. And um, when's the best time to go there? Um, I talked earlier about Florida. For Florida, I like the winter during the dry season. So January, February, March. Uh, for Smoky Mountains, I would go with April or October. And they both have their pros and cons. Early April will get you some of the red buds. And then the wildflowers are starting to kick up. Mid-April, the red buds start fading, but the dogwoods come in strong. And then wildflowers hit their peak. Late April... Um, the dogwoods have faded away. The red buds are gone. The wildflowers are still there. And then black bears start coming out high in numbers. But uh, this is April. And in New England, our trees are just budding. So this is a nice place to go if you want to get a jump on spring. If you get spring fever and you don't want to wait till, you know, till early May. This is like, they're about a month ahead of us. Actually about five or six weeks, it seems like. And some of these old historic cabins, the beautiful roads, wildflowers. And then the amphibians are incredible, the number of salamanders. And fall foliage is the other end of this thing. I like the fall colors. Um, problem is traffic. Traffic is pretty brutal. So if you go in April, most of the people in the park are either wildflower People crazy about wildflowers or photographers. My hotel calls a photographer's month. And it's just a beautiful place. Lots of great strolling around. And uh, here, a bunch of photographers were bothering a coyote and chasing it. And it was driving me crazy. So I didn't want to participate in that. And I just drove like 10 miles. Five, a mile down the road and all of a sudden that coyote that everybody was trying to get a picture of came and stopped and just sat right in front of me. But if I was trying to chase him or anything, he wouldn't, I wouldn't have got the, got the shot. Wild turkeys breeding. It's one of the best places I've ever seen for wild turkeys. You can get three or four feet from them. Uh, this one's vocalizing. Um, for some reason, nobody would be interested. This is a print. <laughs> the um, I walked out to a field and all the turkeys were doing this type of interaction with their wing spread and the female laid on the ground. And then I, and I'm like, this is a cool photo. And then I realized they're mating it. Now I think it's creepy. Um, in the fall, the uh, really large population of white-tailed deer. So in the fall, it's pretty amazing to uh, see the bigger antlers. And then a lot of the times they're in the rut, so they're fighting. And here you have two fighting with the wild turkey in the background. Jumping over a fence. For some reason, about every, this isn't even cropped. For some reason, every few years when I go down there, I get a, a cooperative pileated woodpecker. And this woodpecker just lands three, four feet in front of me. This is not cropped either. You can actually see where he's going into the trees after the carpenter ants. And then the black bear population is really big, um, second to North Carolina, but um, they're up in the trees, they're walking around, the cubs are everywhere. I like April, it's the time I like late April, early May for the black bears, if that's the goal. In the fall, I don't see them that often unless it's a bad year for acorns and walnuts and all stuff like that uh, when they get a little more desperate. But uh, April is prime time, and I could, if I was just looking for black bears, I could probably find 10 to 20 a day. And it's one of my favorite animals, so it works out. And then the little cubs, you can see some bugs flying around them. And this would be, you know, just they're born in January, so this um, photo was taken in April, so he, 
this thing's fresh out of the den. They're born in January, but they don't they don't really come out of the den until April. And then there's a, a growing population of elk there. And it's funny, the elk are always on the North Carolina side. I guess they don't like the Tennessee people for some reason. Uh, then we're, now we're hopping over the West Coast. Uh, Washington State, unlimited opportunity. You could spend a lifetime in Washington State with some of the mountains and Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, uh, the Cascades. It, it's just incredible. Uh, and then the coastline. It's just the, I would, it's one of those few states that you could just spend a whole lifetime just exploring the natural history and the scenery and not even scratch the surface. Is Mount Rainier. I used to do a tour down there and now there's so many forest fires during the height of wildflower season that I, I don't go anymore, but I miss it. And I'll just go on my own. And then, um, even the still wildflowers are here. I'm in the pouring rain, just walking around and enjoying the beauty of the place. But Mount Rainier, Rainier is extra special. And then I went out at night and started walking up the hill to Mount Rainier and doing shots of the Milky Way. And it was this was about two, three o'clock in the morning. I was by myself, and I was I had my headlamp on every once in a while, and I had it shut off. Is that I want to kill my night vision? And um, and then through the glance of my eye, I saw a bunch of like uh, eyes looking at me, and I started getting a little nervous. I'm thinking, you know, hopefully it's not a mountain lion or something. And then the um, and then I turned on my headlamp, and I was surrounded by like twenty deer. And um, this is Olympic National Park. I love Olympic National Park. There's a lot of distinctive habitats. Uh, one of them is really great for old growth trees, rainforests, the coast, um, the mountains. It's just an incredible place. It's like um, a lot of times people say it's five national parks at once. And it feels like all in one. So this is Olympic National Park. And then the, the, it's just incredible tide pools, old growth forests and the rainforests. And uh, this is Hurricane Ridge Highway that goes along the mountaintops, great for wildflowers, great waterfalls. And then I just love um, Olympic National Park. Now we're off to Oregon and um, another beautiful place. The Oregon coast is amazing. Just so many opportunities. And just a lot of beautiful beaches and giant sea stacks. Some of these are 60 to 200 feet tall. So when you're there in person, it's a lot different. And then the lighthouses. And again, the tide pools and the coastal habitats, the anemones. And then um, here we have some stellar sea lions, large colonies of those. And then harbor seals, black oyster catchers. I'm more used to the, the American oyster catcher, but to go out there and see a black oyster catcher is pretty special. And look at the background oysters. Harlequin ducks. Oh, peregrine falcons. I was out there and I was nowhere near the peregrine falcon nest. It was way out of photo range. And all of a sudden, this falcon landed right in front of me. And then the seabird colonies are just incredible. A bunch of mirrors here. And then the wildflowers along the Columbia Gorge, pretty special. The waterfalls are incredible. So Oregon's a special place. Now we're jumping into the Southwest. Out of all the places I go, the Southwest makes me the most uncomfortable. Um, when I'm in different parts of the country and I see a bird or an animal or a habitat, I feel comfortable with it. But uh, desert ecology is where I'm the least knowledgeable. But this is Archer's National Park. Then I've gone out at night and done night photography stuff with photographing the Milky Way with my groups. And this is just night photography, but we'll lighten it up with a light panel. And then the petroglyphs and petroglyphs with some of these old carvings. And it's just absolutely amazing. 
now people are defacing those property um, in Aches National Park. Somebody walked out uh, with like five gallons of bleach three miles down the trail and poured them over the petroglyphs and um, and people are vandalizing that stuff and writing their own names over it. I don't know how people don't learn respect for wildlife or cultures. But it's, it's just a great opportunity. But it's just, to me, it's just so fascinating. You can see some of them, like um, they have the Desert Bighorn, and this is probably the Desert Bighorn from years ago. And then there's a, a lot of the national parks, one of the mistakes you can make is not looking into the surrounding areas. For instance, right across from Archer's National Park at Canyonlands is Dead Horse State Park. And some of these state parks are incredible. Right outside of Bryce, 10 minutes away, is Kodachrome Basin State Park. And here's Bryce Canyon. Um, one of my favorites is Zion. Just really cool, a lot of biodiversity. And then Monument Valley is extra special. Horseshoe Bend in Utah, the Grand Canyon in the snow. It's pretty awesome. Now I'm in uh, Nevada and I'm in Valley of Fire State Park, a great place, and a decent population of Desert Bighorn. And here's another picture of Valley of Fire. And then some more petroglyphs, the petroglyphs, and all those. And then um, I've done a few trips to Bosque del Apache in New Mexico. And uh, this is a special place. Lots of great mammals, coyote sightings, a ton of waterfowl. And then a big migration in the winter, in the late fall of the Sand Hill Cranes and snow geese. So a lot of phenomenal opportunities. You'd want to do this in late November, December, or January. But as you can see, the numbers get really high. So this is a really special place. And three or four hours away is White Sands National Park, formerly National Monument. So now we're in one of my favorite places in the whole world. Um, if I had a gun to my head and I had to live in one state for the rest of my life, or one location, it would be Greater Yellowstone or the state of Maine, um, my two favorites, even though I live in Massachusetts. So Yellowstone is just absolutely incredible, load of wildlife, natural history, history. And um, again, within two or three hours of the place is several national forests that are just as spectacular, old Western towns, uh, ghost towns, wild horse refuges, prairie dog refuges, like there's just, you could spend a lifetime just in this one area. And the geysers and the thermal activity is absolutely spectacular. I'm out there probably in the greater Yellowstone region, probably about six to seven weeks a year. I do a trip there and um, in the winter in February, and I also go in September. And I used to go in June, occasionally I do that. It's hard with June because the logistics, because you're, sometimes you might have an hour ride to the hotel to where you're shooting. And then if you do it sunrise in June and sunset, you're leaving the hotel at about four o'clock in the morning. This is in June, and then the longest time of the year, and coming back to the hotel room at about 11, 12 at night. So it's a, it's a pretty long day. So I don't do many tours in June anymore, but September is pretty spectacular. It's uh, And so is June. But the geysers are pretty amazing. This is a mud pot just bubbling. Great waterfalls. You get the idea. The other mistake people make with Yellowstone is Grand Tetons is um, maybe two hours south of Yellowstone, depending on what part of Yellowstone you're in. And to me, the Grand Tetons is just as good, if not better. So what the average person does is they probably go out to Yellowstone for five or six days 
and spends like a day or two. Uh, this is your first trip in the Tetons. And when they come home, they wish they spent more time in the Tetons. I would give them both equal amount of time, 50, 50. And again, right outside of the Grand Tetons is a lot of national forests and incredible things. But in this, this is June, uh, middle of June, great wildflowers, snow-capped mountains, uh, fall color in the fall. It's just amazing. It's just such a great place. I can't get enough of these places. If I could get on a plane right now, I'd be on my way. Okay, so Grand Tetons. Now let's talk about the wildlife. So uh, one of the mistakes people make with Yellowstone Grand Tetons is they always go for the big mammals. That's great, but there's also the small mammals are kind of cool too. Is their interaction with a yellow belly vomit? Um, lately, I've been spending a lot of time photographing the pika. And again, another animal that's in trouble with the warmer temperatures, but a really beautiful animal. And the badger, um, walking up on a badger den, I was a little, I was really scared with the reputation of the badger, but I didn't have any problems. I have a long lens, so I'm not as close as you think I am. I don't want to disturb my subjects. Black bears um, in May is is bear time in Alaska. Uh, I mean, in Yellowstone and the Tetons, a lot of black bear babies. And um, I find that if Yellowstone had a calendar um, for what to do each month, I would pick January for the best time for the winter. That's when you get the most consistent snowfall. And then if you could live there year round, I'd go in May for the black bears and the grizzly bears. And then into late May, early June, you get into the other baby animals. But May is peak bear season. And you can see this black bear is trying to hide from me. <laughs> and um, it's a really cool place. But I love the bears. I probably have close to um, half a million bear shots in different locations of the country. And then June is baby animal time. So the um here's some baby bison playing with it. And then in June, a lot of times you can't have it all in one season. The older adults, their coats peeling, they don't look as photogenic as they would other times of year. But I'll take it. On the velvet, on the young elk, bald eagles, wolves. Wolves are just so special. One of my favorite birds is a great gray owl. And I was thrilled to get one with the fall color. And I love things that might be common there, but to me, it's just fascinating. Here's a dipper. I'm not used to seeing dippers, except for when I go out there, they're all over the place, but it's fun photographing them and, and watching them dive underwater. And they come up like they look like they're completely dry. Their water repels the the feathers repel the water really well. Mountain bluebirds, red fox, bison. It's just such a fun place. Um, here's one of my favorite mammals, the Yellowstone is a pronghorn. Super fast, large size uh, respiratory system. Here they are, here's one scent marking. The moose population is really good. Um, in the Grand Tetons, baby moose. Here's an adult moose, and I was I took a bunch of rangers on a free photo walk, and um, and then that's how I returned the favor for all the leads they give me. And then we were this bull moose is getting closer to us, so we backed off and we turned around and we had a black bear eating berries behind us. Then the bull moose, and then the black bear, and then um. My question is, which animal is more dangerous? It's actually the moose. And moose fighting, um, what I was talking about, keeping a good network and respecting people's leads and doing things like that. Uh, these two moose fought for three or four days. 
they would lay down for a half hour, then get up and fight for a half hour, then lay down and then fight. And I must have got like 30 text messages when I was in the park about that. The worst is when you fly home and somebody sends you a lead once you're home and you're not there. And they're like, oh, come down the road at this point. We have a grizzly bear playing with her two cubs in the field or a great gray owl with the two chicks and you're home. So I, I try to tell people when I arrive and when I leave. And the moose rut's going on strong at the time I'm there in September. Um, his two female moose notice the ears are back. They're, they're aggravated and highly stressed out with each other. If you're ever hiking through the woods, and you, uh, especially in the spring, and you bump into a moose doing that with the ears back, there's probably a calf nearby, so that can be really dangerous. And then um, in the rotary during the fall, a lot of times the rangers are around and they're like, don't disturb the elk and the photographers can't refuse. They should. And then they end up stopping and taking a picture and they pretend they don't hear the ranger yelling at them. But this is what happened. The elk comes in and hits that car. So three to 400 cars get hit on the side. Good luck turning in that rental car because of the elk in Yellowstone during the month of September in Mammoth. And in the background, you have tons of other cars at this one location, gift shops, ranger stations, restaurants. So it looks safe. But uh, the elk love this field and uh, I respect them. If you want to have a really entertaining lunch break, just kind of, I love to go down and film the elk hitting the cars. And then the rut, I mean, it's just pretty cool here and then vocalize. Black bear in the pouring rain. Well, fall color is beautiful. This, I have to say, is probably my favorite season in Yellowstone. I love the winter. Um, I even, I don't want, you know, three months of it, but I, I love it in New England. I love it um, anywhere. But here's the snow coach we're in. Uh, it's just a winter wonderland. Here we have two bison fighting in the road right in front of us. Um, a lot of times there's more kills. So it's the best time to see your predators. Here's some ravens. Um, go, you know, picking food with the bald eagle. And it's just a winter one going. The bison are just amazing in the winter and thick full coats. The bighorn sheep are at high elevation. By the winter, there's so much snow, they come down to eye level, ground level right in front of you. But you can get some nice rams. I go outside of Yellowstone and I take my groups down some side roads to um, to find the big bull, um, you know, the different rams and stuff. But I love the big one sheep. And this one had a really nice curl to them. But you get some interesting behavior. Uh, coyotes, wolves. So if I had to go to Yellowstone two times a year, I would recommend uh, the fall in September and then January. Red Fox. I didn't get a chance to go through uh, my, my uh, in January, I spent the whole month in Yellowstone in February, minus a few days. And then February, I spent the whole month in Florida. But uh, we did have a sequence where a Red Fox ran by the snow coach and then we stopped the snow coach and the red fox came right up to us and then dug a hole and was eating a, a family of ground squirrels but this was like we had to back up but it was 30 40 feet in front of us trumpeter swans moose river otters it's just such a great place and now last but not least um, is Alaska. I spend, I'll be in Alaska in two weeks doing a Northern Lights tour. Um, and then it's just such a great place. The, um, this is, it's just a photographer's paradise. I kind of felt like my whole life I was trading for my Alaska trips. But this is going out on, by boat through the Kidai Fjords National Park. And then here's some tips on Alaska. 
I recommend to, for your biggest density of wildlife, you want to be on the ocean. But the bigger the boat, the farther the animals are away. Uh, cruise ships would be good for whales, but probably that's about it. And then a boat like this is your most common size. These double deckers or triple deckers. To me, they can't get close enough. That would be great for whales. Um, but it, it, for something like a sea otter or a puffin or something like that, it's too far. So what I do is I go on really small boats, like something about this size, and with my group of five people. And this is my group right here. And we can, and we're out all day. We have control of the boat. We could say stop here, don't go here, spend more time with the orcas, whatever, whatever we want to do. So it's kind of nice being in your own boat, in your own small boat. But it's definitely a lot more expensive. But if you if, if you can get on the water, get as small of a boat as possible and stay out as long as you possibly can. I like the tours that are like eight or nine hours. Glaciers are actually incredible. Um, unfortunately, with the warmer temperatures, sometimes you get some really great calving to see and it's fun where they break off, but then you kind of feel bad about it. And some of the glaciers I've been photographing, when I go back every four or five years, I, I, or every year, I see where it retreats in most years. One of the glaciers I photographed a while ago is now down the street from where I used to photograph it. And just incredible landscape. Um, I love this. This was, um, I was out on a, with the, out with my group and the boat captain said we have a group of moon jellyfish and i was kind of like well we're photographing whales i don't know if i want to see the moon jellyfish but the uh, when we went over to see it there was just thousands of them and it was actually for the people on the trip it was one of their favorite things they saw so if anybody tells you you can see a moon jellyfish it's pretty cool and then we go close by some of these uh, sea lion colonies and you get some great interactions and a lot of bugs, uh, not our, around them, not us. And then I like photographing the animals on the, on the little icebergs. And then a lot of things in the Alaska economy is impacted by salmon. So here we have the salmon fishermen dropping nets. Um, and then it has a huge impact on their lives. But even more so on the wildlife, I'm always pro conservation. And um, here's where the salmon are migrating through and just thousands of birds and whales and all kinds of things. And then some of the kittiwink colonies, just millions of them. That's all kittiwinks. We, this area is called Kittiwink Falls. But well, look at them all. I mean, that's amazing. And that waterfall is about three or 400 feet tall black oyster catcher. Look at all the seabird colonies. So we're going by boat and a lot of that stuff's right in front of us. And then um, different birds, pigeon gallimont. I mean, it's just amazing. And then this was one of my favorites, a rhinoceros auklet. Parakeet auklet, all related to the puffins. Oh, speaking of puffins, tufted puffin. Horn puffin that looks a little bit like our Atlantic puffin. If you notice the big difference is the bill. But coming up on their colonies is just amazing. And one taken off. And then I love going into the see the sea otters. And then some of the areas they're used to people and they just pop up three, four feet from the boat. And then obviously you can't miss the whales. Um, this is a colony of orcas. And technically uh, they're actually considered a dolphin. Humpback whale, it almost looks like he's gonna swallow the tufted puffin. And then we have a horn puffin in the foreground. Humpback whale breaching, bald eagle. I have an eagle fetish. Eagles in the winter. 
And I just spent a lot of time photographing eagles, diving for a fish, the explosion of the water. I have thousands of eagle images. I like showing the backgrounds too with the wildflowers. It's just Alaska has so many eagles along the Alaska coast. If you know what towns to go into, they're just amazingly and all over the place. And then inland Alaska is really beautiful with some of the glacial fed water. Um, we had a boat operator who um, we used last year, and I'm going to use him every year now. He was he, he threw into my itinerary photographing black bears in front of the glacier. And I was like thinking this this is going to be a long shot. And we found like two different groups. The loons. And again, the red front of loon or Arctic loon, I forgot which one it was. A big density of um, of moose, doll sheep. And here I'm showing the habitat where they could go downhill. And then um, we got two more segments. We're going to talk about bears for a second and then the northern lights. And that'll be the end of the slideshow. But the um, we have a lot of great bear spots. And we use a float plane to go into different areas. Uh, this particular day, we counted 40 something bears. But just the interaction on the waterfalls, catching fish. It's just amazing. And then usually right here, you see the cubs. Usually at this spot has a lot of big males, so there's less cubs. So I have a separate spot for cubs. And um, a lot of times I, I recognize from bear behavior when they're about to stand up. And then um, it's fun. Uh, people ask me if I ever get scared of bears. Um, they always make me nervous. I don't think anybody should be comfortable with a bear, but I don't think you should be fearful. And I've only been fearful once. Um, this bear gives me the creeps. And uh, most bears just walk around here, and this one kept walking towards me. And, um, and I had my bear spray out, and then he ended up just walking towards me because there was salmon in front of me. So I backed off and... Um, happily backed off and then he caught salmon in front of me but the, the it, it, i like being with a large group for bear attacks the uh, bear attack is very rare bear fatalities an average of two a year uh, through all of north america so it's very rare to have a bear attack here and then if you put that up cows actually kill more people dogs kill more people auto accidents all the different things, a uh, bear fatality is extremely rare. And um, I've never heard of a documented bear fatality with or attack with four or more people together. So, um, so uh, some people say three, but I haven't researched that, but definitely four. We always say four to be conservative. And then we just get some crazy interactions. Um, the, his a mother player for Cubs. This year we had a high water level at one of our stops, and the bear was climbing on the mother's back. On the could actually could be the father. Too. That no, it would be the mother for this. And then interactions um, between the the mother and the son, or two cubs. And I just love photographing the behavior. And people ask you questions like, "Does the mother know I'm there?" Yes, the mother walked right in front of me. And I don't like to get too close to the bears, but sometimes they come out of the bushes and walk right by you. And then here, um, we're just got off the float plane and then this bear's just yawning in the, he was sleeping and I, my group waited for him. And then he woke up and yawned and stretched and it ended up being a fun shoot for us. And then when they run it towards you and dive in for salmon, it's a lot of fun. And remember, the salmon are a huge part of the ecosystem. Um, there's a plan right now that's been going on for years where they're fighting to, to build one of the Pebble Creek mine, which would be horrible for that area because one of the world's largest populations of salmon are based out of there, and that affects the whole state of Alaska. Uh, it, Bears play fighting and fighting. Even the cubs do it. I just love those interactions.
pretty special. And then um, a lot of times the wolves will come down and catch fish, which is pretty brave. If you notice the um, submissive behavior of the wolf with the tail between the leg. And then um, this was another year. Oh, by the way, this wolf is surrounded by bears. That's why the wolf's so nervous. And then this um, two years ago, I had this teenage wolf that kept walking up towards me and my group. And we get some good photos of that. And then we're going to end with the Northern Lights. Um, the Northern Lights are most active in spring and fall solstice. So that's um, March and September. So that's your peak Northern Light season. And also the Northern Lights are on an 11 year cycle on how active they are based on activity of the sun. So we're coming out of the low end. Uh, the high end is, uh, the peak is supposed to be 2025, but this year will be good. Um, I sign up for a Northern Lights alert through spaceweather.com, it's $5 a month. And they text me every time we get a KPNX of five or six, which is means we can see it in New England. But anyways, the Northern Lights are beautiful. In Alaska, we see the Northern Lights every night uh, because I'm there in March. So the only thing that can mess me up is if a bunch of clouds come in and March isn't that cloudy of a month, but September is. So when I'm there in March, we have almost 100% success. But the Northern Lights are pretty special. Uh, the difference, you do not need to be on a peak year. Uh, the difference, I've been on the low end all the way to the high end. And uh, on the low end, the Northern Lights might be active for an hour or two every night. And that hour or two is just as good as any other year. But on the high end, to be honest with you, it's going the second you leave the hotel and it's dark out to the time you get back uh, to the point where people aren't even pointing it out anymore. They get so used to it. But I would say any year from now through 2028 should be really good. And it's really special with the snow and the northern lights. And it's fun. We stay up with a whole bunch of people and we're all out enjoying the same thing. It feels like an outdoor party all night long. It's, it's fun. And yeah, this is the northern lights with a little bit of moonlight. Um, here, one year... Uh, this was St. Patrick's Day a couple of years ago. And um, I remember screaming to the group, like, look, it's forming the letter R because we had Northern Lights 360 degrees around us. And um, it made the letter R. And I hope if I keep going, one day it'll spell out Slonita photography. And then the bear asked me to stop. So that's the end of this program. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. in some of my adventures and, and thank you very much. That's great, John, thank you. Um, yeah, if you want to um, um, put, your, put your questions in the, uh, in the question and answer box, John, can you see that on the Q&A? No. The, uh, oh yeah. On the bottom, okay. you can open, open that right up. So the question is, do you follow Tamita Skov, S-K-O-V, a.k.a. spaceweatherwoman.com? The answer to that is I think I might know who she is, but I don't know her. There's a lot of people that specialize in the Aurora, but that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I know the... Anybody I know yeah, many of the places that you've shown, I've actually been to, so that was pretty cool. You know, I haven't done Alaska, but I've done the lower 48, and I know that a lot of those places that you've been talking about are really, uh, really our special places. Um, and it's good to think about when to go there, because that's another big um, part of it. So I had another thing in the chat. Can you see that? Oh, Steve just saying was great. I agree. And um, anyway, so... Um, if there's any other questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat or put them in the question and answer. And um, I know uh, this winter uh, weather is not going to be with us much longer. And um, 
Um, I, well, we're here at the center and the, the, the plow in the driveway already. So that's, <laughs> I hope we don't have to do that too much more. So, all right. So I think we're set, John, and I appreciate it very much. And I hope to get to see you in person in between your forays across the country. So, um, yeah, let's make plans for some time. And, um, and thank you for the inspiration and all the things you've done for me over the years. I really appreciate it. Well, it's happy to see that it's gone to good use. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll close it off from here and uh, we'll see everybody next month for uh, David Pogue and talking about climate change and what we should be doing about it. So yeah, thanks everyone. Point, yeah. and th thanks, John. And thank uh, you. Have a good day. And thank you everybody for attending. Have a good night. Bye. All right.